always ready for this. Um, all right, so we kind of left off a little bit abruptly, um, but because this is the good time to start talking about how do I get those numbers, those numerical dates added to geologic time. And uh, there are a few different ways to do numerical dating in geology, but the most commonly used method is radiometric dating, which is based on uh, radioactivity. Now, radioactivity was discovered by Henri Becquerel uh, in 1896. And what uh, happens when we talk about radioactivity and radioactive decay is that you have an unstable isotope called the parent, and it is going to spontaneously decay or break apart. So the atom breaks apart. This is called fission. And when this happens, it releases energy or particles and turns into a more stable product, a more stable isotope, which we call the, uh, the daughter. So basically, the parent breaks apart, gives off energy, becomes a daughter. All right, so what makes this useful when figuring out the ages of rock is the fact that the rate of radioactive decay is constant. It's not like some, uh, you know, some chemical reactions where, um, you know, you heat it up and it happens faster or slower or stuff like that. Radioactivity is just constant. Things do not change how fast it happens. And we measure this constant decay with what's called the half-life. A half-life is the time it takes for half the parent atoms to become daughter atoms. And when it comes to minerals and rocks, there is a certain amount of parent in the mineral when it forms, and all of the daughter began as parent. A good uh, way of looking at this. One of the uh, isotopes typically used is uh, potassium. And potassium uh, breaks it down into argon. Argon's a noble gas that you would not find in minerals. The only way it gets in there is from the breakdown, the radioactive decay of that parent potassium. So what we then can do is measure the amount of parent and daughter in a mineral to figure out how old it was. And what happens is over time the amount of parent decreases and the amount of daughter increases. And we can see this on what's called a decay curve. So here we are at the time that our rock forms where we have all of the atoms are parent. Right? Parent is shown in yellow. After one half-life Half the do uh, atoms are still parent and half are daughter. After another half-life, well, now, right, we took half of the parent and um, uh, that then became daughter, and this continues. So a good way of trying to show this to you guys, or I don't know if it's a good way, but it's a way of trying to show this to you guys. So let's say I have this box here. Hopefully that is 16 squares. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Okay, so that's my 16 parent atoms. After one half-life, half of them, it's going to be eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those have now become daughter. And so we have now eight parent and eight daughter. After the next half-life occurs, if we have eight parent, and we take half of that, that's going to end up being four, right? So one, two, three, four. So now we should have 12 daughter atoms and only four parent atoms. And, okay, if it's four parent, then we take half of that again, right? After the next half-life, you see how it's slowly the daughter increases and the parent 
decreases. And so, um, in any case, that's the radioactive decay curve that we have. Now, the date that gets calculated when you're looking at radiometric dating, dating using this radioactive decay, is when the mineral became a closed system. A closed system means there are no more atoms being added to the mineral and none taken away from the mineral. And uh, this is why when you are doing radiometric dating, you very carefully select your samples to make sure that they were closed systems. And you end up using what's called a mass spectrometer to measure the parent-daughter ratio. That measures exactly how many parent atoms and how many daughter atoms are in your sample. Now, common decay pairs or decay series used, so you see these uh, frequently used by geologists, are uranium lead. Uranium is the parent, lead is the daughter. Also potassium argon, rubidium strontium, and then not so much in geology, uh, more in archaeology they use uh, carbon-14. So that then, oh and I, before I go to that I should just remind you guys that um, also, a way to double check your radiometric dates is to do something called cross-checking. And cross-checking would be not just using one of these decay pairs, but using a few of them. And if all of them have this, end up calculating the same date, then you know that um, your sample was pure, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, contaminated somehow, and that you're, the date you calculated is correct. Now, of course, we don't have mass spectrometers in our houses and stuff, so you are not going to be using one to uh, figure out radiometric dates. But in the lab, we will calculate a few numerical ages. But like I said, I'm going to film a little short video to uh, help you out in how to do that. Um, all right, so that then brings me to this slide here. This is the Geological Society of America official geologic time scale. And so what we have now, these are the different time periods. You can see those listed, and remember those colors correspond to how they would be shown on a geologic map. And we also have the numerical dates added in there, so it's not just based on all well, the rock types changed. Now we actually have numbers associated with things. When we talked about magnetic reversals a couple of lectures ago, that's actually shown on this time scale. Black is normal polarity and white is reverse polarity. So this time scale gives you all sorts of uh, information if you end up working in geology. And then let's just practice a little bit of uh, relative dating uh, techniques. And um, for example, here we have a few different things. We have this pink rock, right? This background pink rock came first. And then this dike came, and then this one came, and how do I know the order? Because this one cuts across that one. And then the last thing was this fault, right? Because it cuts across both of those. But you can do this at a big scale too. It doesn't have to be something small like that. This is an entire mountainside. You can see these are all like nice trees and stuff growing there. We have a few different rock types, a few different things going on. We have this tan rock here, we have the red rocks, and we have this crack here. Well, the red rocks came first. But then that brings the question, did the tan rocks come or did the, the crack, the fault, come next? I can tell you the fault came next. See how these rocks should line up with those? Okay. Well, the f that fault came before the tan rocks because notice it comes up here and it stops. These rocks are not moved, right? They haven't been displaced. If this came after those, it would have displaced. It would have moved those as well. So in this one we have red rocks, fault, tan rocks. And in your lab activity, you're going to practice some of those. And they're kind of fun because they're like little brain teasing puzzles that you can do. So that brings me to the random picture of the day. And today you're lucky you get two of them. Um, that is me standing at uh, next to a big 
sauropod leg bone uh, at Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. That was not the first time I had visited there. I actually visited there, well, I think you can figure out the time period. Um, that's me. That's my brother. Notice the bell bottoms. That was very fashionable for the time, so don't, don't judge me here. Um, yeah, I visited there when I, was, when I was a really little kid in the 1970s. Um, the one thing that bothers me with this, though, that's, that's the same leg bone as that. I didn't grow that much. Oh, well, that's life. All right, guys, have a great day.